Welcome, my name is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and we thank you for taking some time to listen to some audio recordings from the pulpit of the Riverview Baptist Church. Our desire is to show the Lord high, holy, and lift it up, as well as try to be a blessing to those through the Word of God. Please enjoy this message, and we pray that it will be a blessing to your life. Well, if you wouldn't mind to take your copy of the Word of God and turn with me to the New Testament book of Hebrews. The New Testament book of Hebrews and Hebrews in chapter number 11. Hebrews and chapter number 11. We're in a brand new series, Sunday school series, starting today of Have Faith in God. Have Faith in God. And with that, we're going to walk through what is called the Hall of Faith chapter. The book of Hebrews chapter number 11, and this whole Sunday school series is going to be centered and based from Hebrews chapter number 11. Now remember, the book of Hebrews is the commentary on the Old Testament through the filter of Jesus Christ. And so the book of Hebrews is going to refer quite a bit to the Old Testament. And so through this Sunday School series, we're going to fill it through a lot more scriptures than used to because we want to see what the book of Hebrews says, but we also want to go back and see the Old Testament story that this is based off of and learn the principle by faith that each of these men and women had to apply within their own life in order to follow God by faith faith. And so we start at the very beginning, the book of Hebrews chapter number one, or chapter number 11 and verse number one. The book of Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number one, notice what the Bible says. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it, the elders obtained a good report. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he, being dead, yet speaketh. And if you have it in marking things in your Bible, would you mark a phrase that we find in the book of Hebrews chapter number 11? Hebrews chapter number 11, and notice with me verse 4. Notice the phrase here, by faith able. By faith able. And we start off with this uh, first message of this brand new series of Have Faith in God with the idea here, the faith of Abel. The faith of Abel. Now, there are two key passages, two key verses within the book of Hebrews and the first key verse is going to be verse number one. Now, through the Sunday school class, I want us to have two memory verses that I want us to work on every week for the entirety of this. The first one is going to be Hebrews chapter number 11, verse one. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And so I want you to work on this verse for the next week. And I want us to get to the place where we could say it together, because this is going to be a help to you. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now, notice this gives this description of faith. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. Now, some people believe in a blind faith. That is not biblical and it's not found. The idea of a blind faith is, I don't know what's there. I'm going to step out. But faith is not blind. It has substance. Amen. It has evidence. Now, of course, you can't see faith, but you could see the consequences, the ramifications, the ripple effects because of faith. Faith is a choice that we make, but faith 
always produces action. If you take notes, put that somewhere. This is something that's going to be repeated over and over, but it's something that you have, need to have in your own mind. Faith always produces action. Faith always produces action. So if somebody says, I've got faith, well, what are you doing? Nothing. Then you don't have faith. Because faith always produces action. That if you have faith in God, that means that you're going to be obedient to the things that God has given you to do and let God take care of the things that you cannot do. Does that make sense? Yeah. If you have faith, you are going to do the things that you know you're supposed to do and allow God to take care of the things you cannot do. So if I have faith in God... That means because I trust him, I'm going to be reading my Bible. Because I trust him, I'm going to be praying. Because I trust him, I'm going to be doing these things. Because I trust him, I'm going to be faithful to church. And because I'm being obedient to the things that God's told me to do and whatever else God gives you to do, then I'm going to trust him to take care of these other things in my life that I have no control over, that I need him to answer, that are beyond me. Does that make sense? What, we, what we're understanding here is that we need to be in motion. We need to be moving forward, always moving in forward. And while we're moving forward, God is going to clear the path. God is going to take care of this. God is going to direct the track, uh, tracks. He's going to move us. He's going to turn us. We're going to trust him. We're just moving forward. Always be moving forward. But faith is the substance of things Hoped for. Now that word hope is not a wistful, empty thing. The word hope is a confident expectation of something or someone to come. That's a solid thing. When I have hope, I'm not hoping it's pretty outside today. I'm hoping, I'm faithing, I am trusting. When you see the word hope, you could put in your mind faith. You could put in your mind belief. It is, I put my trust that God is going to do what he said he was going to do. I have my hope in a real God who keeps his word. So now faith is the substance of things hoped for. So because I hope in God, because I faith in God, because I trust in God, there's going to be a substance there. There's something to it. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. But there's going to be evidence I am trusting in God, and as I trust God, there's going to be some substance, there's going to be some evidence, some proof that my God is real and that he is working. I'm not showing up to church because of culture, because of some invisible thing. I'm showing up to church because God has proven himself over and over and over. The reason why I follow God is not to get something from him. I follow God because of what he's already done for me. There is evidence. My faith is a response to God. Not an initiation to God. Meaning God is always previous. God has already shown himself. He has already proven. He's already real. There's evidence. There's substance. I am just responding to that proof. To that evidence. This is why this verse is so important for the next couple weeks. I want you to work on this memory verse with me because this will be a help because we want to see good things. Remember, the theme for this year is with God, all things are possible. Oh, and the answers to prayer we've seen this year. It's been amazing to watch God work. And what we've seen is we've had evidence Look at what God did here. Look at what God did here. Hey, I wasn't expecting this. I was expecting God to answer my prayer over here, but he answered it over here. That was God. I saw him work. Amen. We have proof. We have evidence. I'm responding by faith to that evidence. So here we're trying to describe a little bit what faith is, but what is the definition of faith? Notice with me in the book of Hebrews chapter number 12. Now, I haven't even touched Abel yet, but we have to describe a little bit about what faith is if we're going to be able to see the faith in these people. Now, the book of Hebrews chapter 11 describes faith. Hebrews 11 describes faith. Hebrews chapter 12 verses 1 and 2 defines faith. 
the definition. What is the definition of faith? Verse number, uh, chapter 12, verse 1. Wherefore seeing also we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight, the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the Father. What is the definition of faith? uh, Hebrews 12, verse 2, looking unto Jesus. You understand, it is not how much faith you have that is important. It is the object of your faith that matters. Looking unto Jesus. What is faith? Looking unto Jesus. What we're trying to do is we're trying to make it simple. Faith is looking after Jesus. That's what the Christian life is. It is the never-ending pursuit of Jesus Christ that I may know Him. I'm looking at Him. And as I'm looking at Him, I'm following after Him. I'm moving towards Him. I'm trying to get closer to Him. And as I move forward, God takes care of the other things. Faith always produces action. My faith is in Christ. So because of who Christ is, because I know the answers to prayer, because I know what he's done for me, I respond to him, being obedient to the things he's given me to do and trusting him to take care of those things that I cannot do. What we're doing is we're defining faith and trying to make it as simple as possible. Faith always produces action. So with this, go back and let's examine the book of Hebrews chapter number 11. And we hit the very first person that is described here to describe faith. So we could look, this is someone who stepped up by faith. You can't see faith, but it has evidence and it has substance. So let's look first of all, at Abel. Notice with me, if you don't mind, in verse number four. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. Now, the Bible testifies that this story was true. Even Jesus Christ described it in Luke chapter 11 and Matthew chapter number 23 that he said that faith was martyred. He was killed for his righteousness, killed for responding to God. And that the person that killed him was his brother Cain. We've heard the story of Cain and Abel. Notice with me in the book of Jude as we see the description of Cain and what Cain's actions In Jude and verse number 11. Now, we have Abel who stepped out by faith. We're going to go back to Genesis and actually see the story. But we have two brothers. Abel responded by faith. Because he had faith, faith produced action. His action is that he did what God told him to do. In comparison, he had a brother who had heard the same information who did not respond to God by faith. He responded to God based off of his feelings. By, this is what I feel is right. By his stubbornness, by his determination. Notice as the Bible gives commentary on this in the book of Jude. Notice with me in verse 11. Jude verse 11. Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of of Cain. Here the Bible actually describes, now the book of Jude is written in the New Testament. The book of Genesis and the account of Cain was given in about 4,000 BC. So 4,000 years later, the Bible is giving commentary on this event that occurred and it is describing the way of Cain. What is the way of Cain? It is those that are self-willed and self-determined. The way of Cain is those that are self-willed and self-determined. You see, you live your life one of two ways. You live your life by force or you live your life by faith. For example, we're familiar with an old toy like this. 
where it had all the um, all of the little cool shapes. It has the red side and the blue side, and it opens up, and you could get the little yellow pieces out. Do you know that you could stick a circle inside of a square? Now it doesn't go easy. It doesn't flow naturally, but you could force that thing in there. You could squeeze it and get it in there. You can get some things done by force. May I say it this way? You may get some things done by self-will. You can get some things done by uh, determination. However, you have to fight the entire time to do so. The faith life is just be. Leaving in God and responding to God and allowing God to take care of those things you can't take care of. The faith life is the best life because I trust in God. I don't have that stress, that fight on me. So this is what we see in the two brothers. By faith, Abel. Then we see the way of Cain. Abel responded to God by faith being obedient to what God had told him to do and allowing God to trust the other things. Whereas the way of Cain was saying, I do what I feel is right. This is what I have determined right. This is what I see to do. This is what I feel to do. And is determined to do his own way so much that even when it was pointed out to be wrong, he did it anyways. So if you don't mind, as we've kind of given you the commentary on the story, let's look at the story. Turn with me to the book of beginnings. Genesis chapter number 4. All the way at the very beginning. Genesis chapter number 4. And if you don't mind, let's see this idea of the faith of Abel. The faith of Abel. Now notice with me in Genesis chapter 4. And the first thing we want to describe to you is the family of Abel. The family of Abel. Now we know that the second son of Abraham and not Abraham of Adam and Eve was we had Cain who was first and then Abel. Notice with me at Genesis chapter number 4. Genesis chapter 4. And Adam knew Eve his wife and she conceived and bare Cain and said, "I have gotten a man from the Lord." And she again bare his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground and an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of the flock and the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. So what we see here is that Adam and Eve were the parents Now, there were some things that we know about Adam and Eve. For example, Adam had been spoken directly to by God. So God revealed himself to Adam and gave him some instructions. So much that we saw that the instructions were even given in Genesis chapter number 3. Notice with me in Genesis 3, and we could see the first promise of a Redeemer. And verse number uh, 15, Genesis 3, 15. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. And unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, And has eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow thou shalt eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat of the herb of the field. And the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thy return to the ground, for out of it thou wert taken. For dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. And we... Verse 20, And Adam called his wife Eve, because she was the mother of all living. And unto Adam also, and to his wife, did the Lord God make coats of skin and clothe them. And the Lord God said, and it goes on and talks about how they kicked him out. But notice this. There are some things that Adam and Eve had learned from God 
that they revealed to their children. Now, we know that they didn't have a written word of God, but we also know that the word of God, <laughs> that, <laughs> that, excuse me, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So God had revealed some things to Adam and Eve, and Adam and Eve had told Cain and Abel. We have the story of two children who were told the same thing, but each one of them responded differently. What was different? It was not the information. They didn't treat Cain differently than Abel. But they gave them both the same information, but one of them obeyed, applied, took it for themselves. The other one said, no, I'll do whatever I want. So this is the story, not of two people that were raised differently, but two people who responded differently when the word of God was given. So we have Cain and we have Abel. What was it that, that Adam and Eve, the family of Abel, had given to them? Well, there are four things that we know that they had been revealed to, that they had told their children. First of all, all men are sinners. All the way back in Genesis chapter 3, you know what we learned? All men are sinners. Dad, how come we don't go to that garden anymore? We're not allowed. Why? Because God had one rule and we couldn't even keep that one rule. And because of that, we were kicked out of the garden. All men are sinners. By the way, you inherit your sin nature from your father. It's your daddy's fault. You're a sinner because of your father. You inherited that nature. You are not a sinner because you sinned. You sin because you're a sinner. Amen. Meaning that you don't have to have a course to teach your kid how to be selfish. He's that way automatically. Amen. You don't teach a course to your kids to teach them how to lie. They do it automatically. They sin because they're sinners. And you're a sinner because you inherited that sin nature from your parents. And so Adam and Eve had taught their kids, all men are sinners. Something else that they did is that sin must be covered. Sin must be covered. Now remember, what was the first thing that Adam and Eve did after they ate the the fruit, and they realized something. They realized that they were naked. What was the first thing they did? They covered themselves. They made a covering. Because of their sin, it needed to be covered. Now, that was something that was revealed to them. They didn't know everything that was going to happen with Jesus and the blood, but they did have some things revealed. Without a doubt, they knew that they were sinners. Without a doubt, they saw that because of their sin, it needed to be covered. What else do we know is that every man-made way to cover is worthless. What did Adam and Eve cover themselves with? Fig leaves. Was that acceptable? It was not. It was not good enough. What we understand is that God will provide a covering for us. What we see here, notice with me if you don't mind, in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 21. And unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skin and clothe them. So the way that they attempted to cover themselves was not acceptable. That God clothed them. By the way, we also learned that something had to die because of their sin. You know what man-made religion does? Is they try to cover themselves. Oh, you're righteous. If you do this, if you do this... It's a religion of doing. What can you do for yourself? However, the Bible way of doing it is that God will provide a covering. God will take care of it. Can we trust Him? And so Adam and Eve had these things clearly revealed to them. And they gave that to Cain and Abel. The faith of Abel started with what he heard his parents say to him concerning God and God's word. What an influence parents have. Do you know where the faith of a child begins? By obeying what the parents have told them. That's where faith begins. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. 
his parents gave them. That's why the influence of a parent is so important. Because it is the parents and what they put into their children that are going to help them respond to God properly. Does that make sense? But they had this. We have the family of Abel. The second thing we see is the flock of Abel. The flock of Abel. Now, when it came time to give an offering to the Lord, God had already given them the principle that something had to die because of the sin. That their fig tree religion did not work. So you have Cain and Abel. By the way, let me take a running start at this. When God had promised in Genesis 3.15 that the woman, the seed of the woman was going to come a descendant that was going to destroy, that was going to bruise Satan's head. Now, did Satan, uh, Eve believe Satan was real? He talked to her. They had a conversation. She knew exactly. Do you think she was friends with Satan after this? Did she recognize him as the enemy? And so God said, guess what? You're going to have a seed. You're going to have a descendant that when he comes, he is going to destroy, crush Satan's head. Well, don't you think she'd be excited about that? I mean, let's get rid of that enemy. So children had never been born before. Just as another gee whiz, Adam and Eve never had belly buttons. They were not, never born. They never had an umbilical cord. They didn't need them. So the very first child that was born was Cain. And so when Cain was born, she said, and I've gotten a man from the Lord. She goes, this is it. This is the answer to prayer. I've gotten the promise. However, when Abel was born, you know what she called his name? Vanity. Why? Because she's already dealt with raising Cain. That was a nice little wordplay there. She got through raising Cain. And realize this is not the child that's going to promise. This guy's already got issues. So by the time she had Abel, she goes, vanity. This is not what I hoped for. This is not the, the thing I expected. There's something to a name, especially back then. But Abel responded to their thing. So now it came where both of them were going to worship the Lord. By the way, both Cain and Abel were going to worship God. Do you think both Cain and Abel believed that God was real? Yes, absolutely. And so Cain was a tiller of the ground. He was a farmer. He worked in the fields, did the flo- uh, did all that. Abel was the keeper of the flocks. So when it came to give an offering, both of them gave an offering. Both of them did it with a sincere desire to worship God. Both of them gave their best. Cain, he took the first part of the offering and said, God, I'm giving you this. I worked hard for this. This is what came up. I'm offering to you this to you. Abel said, I'm going to take the best of the flock and I'm going to give it to you. And when they offered it to God, God accepted Abel's but refused Cain's. Why? Both of them were trying to worship God. Why did God not accept Cain's? Because we could only worship God in spirit and in truth. God will only accept worship in the way that he said to do it. There is a lot of things done in the name of worship today. There are churches all over, even nearby us right now, that are having a quote-unquote worship service that God will not accept. Now, are these people sincere when they're worshiping God? Yes. Do you think they're trying to do their best? Yes. But God does not accept it. Why not? Because he did not do it the way that God told him to. That's exactly what we see here. That God accepted Abel's and he refused Cain's. So the faith of Abel led him to give an offering that God required. By what Abel did with his flock, he declared boldly that God is right. Cain, however, said, no, I'm right. 
I could do whatever I want. God should accept whatever I give him. By the way, this is where we all struggle. We're all going to insist that we're right. Or we're going to concede that God is right. That's part of our problem. We like to fight for us being right. We like to show everyone I'm right. So much so that you may even replay arguments in your head. And think about what I should have said to show him. That's pride. That's us trying to get our own way. We have to be careful with that. No, no, what, what happened to this? Well, notice with me in verse number five. But unto Cain and to his offering, he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth and his countenance fell. What happened? Cain was mad. God, you should accept whatever I give to you. Instead of him getting mad, he should have said, you know what? I'll do what you tell me to God. But no, he decided to dig in his heels and say, I'm right. You should accept whatever I give to you. Does that sound familiar? Yes. I'm right. I'm right. I don't care what you say. I'm right. And he was mad. How dare someone say that the way he's doing things is wrong. I'm right. I should worship God however I want. So what happened? Verse number six. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? Why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou dost not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. You know what God did graciously? God talked to Cain personally. Now it's not through mom and dad. God spoke to him personally and said, Cain, if you just do what I tell you to do, it's going to be all right. What an opportunity he had. Cain had plenty of time to repent, to get things right. You know what, God? I'm going to do what you tell me. I, it's not what I feel like doing, but I'm going to trust you and I'm going to do what you told me to do. He could have responded that way. But after God himself told Cain, don't do that. Do what I tell you to do. You know how Cain responded? He dug his heels in even more. After God spoke to him, I don't care what you say. I don't care if you're God. I'm going to do what I want to do. Amen. Yeah. This is the way of Cain. I don't care what the preacher says. I don't care what the Bible says. I'm going to do what I want to do. This is the way of Cain. And so Cain continued with his wicked ways. Notice with me, verse 8. And Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass that when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against his brother and slew him. Why? Because Cain was miserable. And his brother just reminded him how he rejected, how Cain rejected God. And Abel was doing what was right. Has Abel done anything wrong? No, he worshiped God the way he wanted. God expected him to. But Cain said, I should be worship God however I want. And looking at someone who's doing right makes them miserable. By the way, we see that in our country today. We have people that hate Christians. Why do they hate them so much? Because they want to do whatever they want to do. How dare God tell me that? And it's a rebellion against God. Not us, but they're going to take it out on us because our presence reminds them how God does not accept them, doesn't accept the way that they're doing things. And they're stubborn and they're digging in. They've had an encounter with God and they refuse to obey God. They've had an encounter with God somewhere and they rejected him. And they want to be justified in their rejection. But... The brother, just him living for the Lord was enough to make Cain miserable. That conviction that was there. Now, God followed up with Cain, verse 9. And the Lord said unto Cain, where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? The answer is yes. And he said, what hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me. From the ground. 
what we see here is that disobedience to the Lord lives, leads to a tragic life. So we started off with a family of Abel that he was given the word of God. Just simple truths that his parents had learned and that was given to the boys. We could see the flock of Abel. That Abel responded to God by faith doing it the way that God asked him to do. Cain, however, did not and was upset that God would not allow Cain to do things the way that he felt was right. So eventually Cain killed Abel. Which brings me to one last thing, the future of Abel. The future of Abel. Notice the very end of verse number 10. And he said, that's God, what hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. With that, turn with me back to the book of Hebrews, chapter number 11. The book of Hebrews, chapter number 11. And let's see the New Testament commentary on this. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number 4. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number 4. Hebrews 11 verse 4, it says, By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, notice this, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. God says his blood from the ground is calling unto me. It's speaking to me. What is it saying? Well, what we see here, what is it saying? Is that God is hearing the blood of the wronged and that God is going to make it right. God is going to take care of that. We could even see that in the book of Revelation where it says that the blood of the martyrs are crying out, God when are you going to take care of this? When are you going to take care of this? Now, the age of martyrs have not passed. In fact, within this last week, it may be ramping up. You never know. Now's the time to start living for the Lord. Because if you're not living for the Lord now, mm -hmm. and when everything falls apart, you will not live for the Lord. Now's the time to start living for the Lord. But martyrs are still going to occur. People are still going to die for the faith. And their blood is going to speak to God. That God is going to revenge. He's going to take care of that. There are many people who have been terribly wronged. But we must have the faith to know that God will one day make things right. That the Bible says that he being dead yet speaketh. That God is going to remember his blood. And by the way, he did take care of Cain. He did not allow that to go unpunished. <laughs> and he dealt with that. He being dead yet speaketh. We could see this principle here. We need to do what's right no matter what the cost. That God can use even when we are wronged. To still get us a word accomplished. If you've never taken the time to read the story of Lady Jane Grey. I encourage you to do that. I think we have it in the Christian Life Journal. But Lady Jane Grey is a powerful testimony of a martyr. If you've never heard it. Maybe I'll quickly just take the time to do it. Lady Jane Grey. Was <laughs> a young lady in England. You had Henry VIII. Who was uh, the last of his line or began the Tudor line, and he had a son by the name of James. Now, James was sickly. When he became king, he died. Well, when he died, the kingdom was in an uproar because his next daughter was Mary, and she was a staunch Catholic. And at this time, England had now considered itself a Protestant. It's now separate from the Roman Catholic Church. Well, because people were afraid that Mary was going to bring things back into Catholicism, that they decided they were going to put a coup up. And what they did is they took a young 16-year-old girl by the name of Lady Jane Grey, who happened to be the cousin of Mary and Elizabeth, so much that they played together when they were kids. Well, they forced her to become queen against her will as a political thing. Yet, this is a young lady who knew her Bible. She was able to debate any Catholic priest 
and confound them because she knew her Bible. She would write to many of the Protestants, 16 years old, and she's writing uh, to Protestant leaders about the Bible and discussing things about the Bible and things that she's learning about it. Someone who just loved the Lord. Well, Mary, of course, did not take this well, and many people saw Lady Jane Grey as a, as a pretender, and so they supported uh, Mary. And so Mary took the throne after just Lady Jane Grey ruling just for several days. Well, because she became such a Protestant um, figurehead that people respected Lady Jane Grey. Now, Lady Jane Grey is just trying to live for the Lord. But she said, found it um, out that she just needed to kill her. And it began what uh, became known as the reign of terror for uh, Bloody Mary. She was called Bloody Mary because she killed so many um, people who uh, disagreed with the Catholicism, with Catholic religion, with people who said, I just believe the Bible. I'm going to trust the Bible. I'm not going to bow down to your Pope. I'm not going to bow down to your idols. I'm not going to listen to those type of things. And that they made a stand. And so Bloody Mary killed a lot of them. And her cousin, her beloved cousin, was one of them. When they finally took Lady Jane Grey and they brought her to the executioner thing, she... uh, (laughs) looked at the executioner and said, you just do your job well, just do it quickly. The executioner was so choked up that he had a hard time even trying to kill her. She said some prayers, she quoted scripture, she forgave everyone, and she died a martyr. What happened? Her blood speaketh. A testimony went out and it affected so many other people that this is how a Christian deals with opposition. Lady Jane Grey didn't go up and said, Listen, Mary, you are so wrong. We're going to topple you. You're going to get it. Hear some people speaking that away now? That's not how a Christian responds. A Christian responds by faith. That we're be obedient to what God has given us to do. And let God take care of everything else. Even if it brings us to martyr. Notice as we go back to the book of Hebrews chapter number 12. Remember Hebrews chapter 11 defines or describes faith. Hebrews chapter 12 describes faith. Notice with me Hebrews chapter 12. We'll finish this up. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Wherefore, seeing we are compassed about with such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, notice this, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame And is set down at the right hand of the Father. You know what Jesus did? He said for the joy that was set before him. Endured the cross. He went to the cross with joy. Why? That's how a Christian responds. That even if it comes to the time of persecution in our country. We respond to God. And expect God to take care of things. Even if we die. Can you trust God? He being dead, yet speaketh. You said, well, this doesn't sound fun. What it is, is can you trust God with all areas of your life? Even your death. Can you trust God with all areas of your life? Even when there's people that are opposing you. You understand that this message is going to become more important in the days to come. Can you trust? Live your life by faith. Just being obedient to what God's given you to do and allowing him to take care of the things that you have no control over. Can we trust God? Some things in our country may have not gone the way that we feel like it should, but can we trust God? Does God know what he's doing? Do we have to throw a hissy fit and cry over it? No, we don't. We can keep going on and trust God. That's faith. Faith always produces action. 
Thank you for listening to this audio message. This is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and I encourage you to take this information that you just received and make a specific decision to follow after the Lord. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, let me beg you to take the time to receive Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. If you are saved, I encourage you to make a decision in your life to help you get closer with the Lord. If there's anything specific we can do to be a blessing or to pray for you, we encourage you. Look us up on the internet at riverviewbc.com. Once again, that's riverviewbc.com. Or if you would prefer to call us, you can give us a call at area code 920 920- Five three zero six three zero eight. Once again, that number is nine two zero five three zero six three zero eight. If there's anything we can do to be a blessing or an encouragement to you, please let us know. We would love to make ourselves available. Thank you.